Uh, good morning, everybody. It's a great, great pleasure to be here, especially to talk about this uh, new book, Foresight. Uh, we are expecting in, in this conference to have new conversations on faith and science, and I think this book brings new conversation, uh, new reasons for us to believe that uh, indeed, intelligent design is, the, is be, uh, far the best explanation for the origin of life and the universe. So, the uh, intention of this talk is to guide you through a tour of evidence as related to foresight. So, let's start. Well, yesterday morning I was checking in the Amazon site for the performance of this new book, and I was really pleased. As you can see here, it's now number one release in evolution. Isn't that great? <laughs> yeah, I love it. Uh, okay, so what is foresight? What was the reason for us to select this title for the book? If you look at the American, the English dictionary, for the meaning of this word foresight, you find this, the ability to predict or the action of predicting what will happen or be needed in the future. It's a great ability, isn't it? And if you also put foresight in, on Google and look for figures, image, you always find the mind behind it. This ability is always connected, linked to a mind. So I would like to expand the definition of foresight a little bit more. It's the ability unique of a mind to do those predictions, to look at the future, to shape the future, to see what will be needed in the future, and to provide solutions for those problems, for those needs. That is foresight. But I, I, I was looking at Google, and I found a really good, I think the best figure to, <laughs> to show you what it, foresight is. You see? That's great, isn't it? When you look at this, you fully understand the meaning of foresight. It's the ability unique of a mind to look at the system. The system is not working yet, but this mind can figure out how the system will work and realize, figure out in that system that a major life or death problem will happen. And in advance, shaping the future, looking for needs in the future, provide the solution, the helmet. Isn't that great? So let's expand the definition of foresight a little bit more. The ability unique of a mind to provide in advance ingenious solutions for future life or death problems. Well, do we see foresight related to minds? A genius minds, of, of, uh, indeed. Like Henry Ford, when he was uh, thinking of making the first car, he was also able, uh, capable of foresight. Why? Because he anticipated some needs for that car. For instance, he installed a steering device because he knew he would come to heels and he would need to make turns, right? And also brakes were there from the very beginning because he was able to anticipate the need for brakes. Or in those heels, sometimes you would need to brake the car. So that's foresight. A worker of a, of a mind providing for the future and an ingenious mind, really clever minds, are able to do it. Oh, another is an example, if you want to jump like this crazy guy, you must have foresight, right? To anticipate needs for the future, like the helmet. If you don't land properly, you need the helmet, or to slide. When you land, you need the ski boards. Uh, okay, some minds have foresight. 
but not proper foresight sometimes, as you see there. So foresight, this, the kind of foresight that I talk in this book is the ability to predict needs for the future from a genius mind and to able to provide proper solutions, not those ones, you see? Okay, so the question is, can we find signs of foresight, clues, signatures of for foresight in the universe and planet Earth? Well, if you ask that for the present scientists, the naturalists, the evolutionists, they will say no. The, the, the whole universe and life were the products of a thing that we call nothing. Professor Michael was talking about that yesterday. It's even hard to define what it, this nothing is, right? But they believe that nothing, incapable of foresight, because it has no mind, no purpose, no planning, made for nothing and using nothing, everything. The universe and planet Earth, and then life on Earth, would be the product of a mindless process, incapable of foresight. Well, is that for real? When we look at the universe, when we look at life, do we confirm those predictions that a mindless, mind, a mindless process that we call nothing, and incapable of foresight made the universe and, the, and life that is in it? Or do we see signatures, patterns, evidence for a mind who, which anticipate problems and provided proper solutions? So let's uh, inspect the universe and life, searching for clues to solve this foresight enigma. Let's start it. Well, if, you, you, if we have nothing, it's a big problem to have a new universe and life, right? We started from nothing. So what was the solution for problem zero for life in the universe, to make life in the universe? And what was the solution? I have tried to summarize here what was the solution, and it, would, it was a really clever one. If we look at the universe, and if we look at life, we see Signs of ingenious foresight. Why? Because what was made was a very diverse material universe with multiple options. We have cold but hot regions. We have dark but uh, light sources to illuminate some place. We have two trillion galaxies with a hundred billion stars in each one of these galaxies. So we have plenty of choices, right? To install life in this universe. Our galaxies are also with different shapes and stars at different stages, emitting light in the whole visible region. We have a colorful universe with many different colors. It's an exciting universe. It's not boring at all, right? So we have a colorful, diverse, and beautiful universe for us to see. We are able to see it with your, our eyes. But be careful. It's beautiful, but it can be dangerous. So uh, the stars have different stabilities. They are colorful, but they have different stabilities. And uh, uh, there are many planets, but be careful too, because Look for proper conditions for this planet to function as a possible home for life. So we have solutions, but also problems. So let's talk about the first major problem to install life in the universe, what I call the foresight or death problem, number one. If we have so many ga galaxies and so many stars, we have to select at least one to uh, install in, in that, close to that star, life. So what was the problem number one? In which type of galaxy, in which region of that galaxy, near which group of stars and nearest, which single star would be the best place to place a planet? And for the viability and long-term safety and endurance of life, 
It's a big challenge, isn't it? And also, for the beauty and pleasure too, we don't want only to survive in that planet, we want to have fun, to contemplate this universe with so many galaxies and stars, right? And for the beauty and pleasure to be able to contemplate the universe that has been made as a whole. So what would be the best place to place the Earth? Exactly where the Earth is. I don't know if you have heard it, but the uh, Milky Way Galax has been uh, calculated to be the best possible galax to place a planet. It's spiral, but it's also planar. So every, uh, all of those bodies that are on, sitting on the same planet, but plan protects us from the activity on the, from the center. So they block us, they protect us, they shield us from the activity from the center. And pl planet Earth was uh, placed on the boundary of a star-rich arm of a planar spiral galaxy. It was a really clever decision. Why? Because we have the most spectacular yet habitable point in the Milky Way to be. You know, it, it could have been placed it far away from, from the arms in the really dark region, but it would be boring, no stars around. It could have been placed it exactly in the center of the galaxy, too, too much uh, cosmic activ activity, or it could have been placed on one of those arms, a lot of stars around, but dangerous stars. Could be an exploding star or, or near to explode star, uh, explode star. So the place where the Earth was placed is really, really nice. It's far away from danger, but it's close away to those dangers so we can contemplate them. Isn't that great? So the conclusion is that the Earth is in the presidential suite of the universe. We may not be in the center, as Professor Michael was saying last night, but who cares about the center? Would you like to be in the center? No, you want to be in the presidential suite of the universe, right? In a calm, beautiful, safe, and long-lasting last, place. That's exactly where the Earth is. We are far away from danger, but we are also close to the many stars. We can contemplate it. It's a wonderful place where the Earth has been located. So Earth was booked for the presidential suite of the universe. It's in the dark fir firmament. It's dark enough so we can see. There's not too much light pollution, but it's sparkled with many stars. So when you turn off the lights, when you're in the countryside, and you look at the stars, you look at the star and see, wow, what a show, right? So, and also we have a transparent atmosphere that allows us to see this most magnificent view. Most of the planets that have atmosphere, they are not transparent. So we would not see the, the universe from there. Okay, so the place was really nice, but still we need to, to select a star to be our companion. So that's... Uh, foresight or death problem number two. Which star to select to be Earth companion? Able to properly illuminate and heat us for billions of years. So it should be a long-term stable star, right? So what was the solution? The sun. The sun is great in many, many ways. It's nearly the perfect star. It's the perfect star, star in size, emission, and stability. It emits in the UV, visible, and RR range. It's great. I, I'll explain that to you. And, and also work as a free heat and energy provider. You don't pay the bills, right, for the sun? 
And it will remain stable up to 5 billion years. So it, it emits in the visible region. Why? Because it, to make the, the planet colorful. RR is to hit us. And UV also has lots of benefits for life, like the vitamin D killing some microbes. And it's stable for 5 billion years. You could select a good star, but if you were incapable of foresight, you could select a star that is really great now, but it will explode it in a few years. And that would be a disaster for life, right? But the other day, they published an article saying, in 5 billion years, sun will explode and Earth will be destroyed. And we will look at the comments, and there were people that were concerned. <laughs> you know, it's take a little bit too long that we expect for Jesus to come back, but five billion years? <laughs> well, if you look closely, you see, well, people have estimated that more than 1,200 foresight or death problems were solved with really clever solutions for the universe to accommodate life. Like, uh, it's a really safe place where we are, but sometimes invaders uh, come in, like uh, comets, asteroids. So what was the solution? Let's put big planets around, so they will work as cosmic guardians. The other ones in the solar system are protecting us. When an asteroid tries, tries to hit us, they deviate those asteroids or they attract those asteroids by gravity, protecting us from those invaders. So we have guardians in this presidential suite of the universe taking care of us. Uh, we are at the perf perfect distance from the sun, the surface, Average temperature is 16 Celsius, which is great. It's about the temperature we have today. Uh, we have also conditions for this, in this planet to have water as a liquid, as a solid, as a gas. It's really nice. But there was another problem. For sight of that problem, number 347. <laughs> Sun was emitted in a really good combination of light. And, but the UV, there was a problem, uh, what I call a devil-angel paradox for the UV radiation. Part of that radiation was good, but part of that radiation was really bad. What is that? UVA was perfect, very good. But UVB was good too, but it was too much, excessive UV, UVB radiation. And UVC was, was devil, it was really bad. So what was the solution for this paradox? As extremely ingenious chemical solution. The guy knows chemistry very well. <laughs> and what was that? He was adding an atmosphere with nitrogen plus oxygen in the right proportion, three to one. And the chemistry behind the ozone layer is amazing. Uh, you don't know. I don't know if you have heard about it, but the ozone is not a natural constituent of our at atmosphere. It's made by the UV radiation. So I'll try to explain to you how it works. It's difficult even to explain. I'll try. You know, sun is emitting UV, but in different regions, like UVE is really energetic and and pro a problem for life, but nitrogen is there to block it completely. UVC is also bad, but oxygen is there and block UVC. But as oxygen absorbs the energy from UVC, it breaks down in atomic oxygen. And atomic oxygen reacts with molecular oxygen, making what? Ozone. And now the ozone layers uh, do what? It, it does protect us from excessive UVB radiation. UVC makes ozone, and ozone now is taking care of the excessive UV, UVB radiation. So it takes 90% of this radiation and just let 
10% of UVB, exactly the right amount of UV, UVB we need, is now being filtered by the ozone layer. But what happened with the ozone? As, as it absorbs the energy of UV, UVB, it decomposes back to oxygen and atomic oxygen. So the cycle is refueled. It's amazing chemistry. And what about UVA? This atmosphere is fully transparent to UVA. It's a masterful interplay of chemistry. So it's truly amazing. What causes the problem? Harmful UVC and excessive UVB provide the solution to the problem they cause. Great, isn't it? But there's another problem, problem seven, 785. It's another paradox of stability with reactivity. Oh, we must have a stable atmosphere, right? They should not re the gases should not react with each other, otherwise this atmosphere will be destroyed. But we need some reaction to occur, because we need nitrogen for our proteins. Without the nitrogen from the atmosphere, we would not be here today, because the nitrogen must be uh, converted into proteins. So what was the solution? Lightning. I don't know if you have heard about it, but you know, you see lightning, you see what is the purpose of this? You know, it kills some people sometimes. <laughs> uh, but lightning is a blessing. Without lightning, you would not be here today. You know this? Why? Because lightning provides the energy for nitrogen to react with oxygen. And then you, and then you make NOx. And this NOx is converted in the soil to ammonia. And ammonia is converted in protein. And proteins are converted into you. Great, isn't it? It was a great solution for this paradox. It's um, the, re uh, the gases that they don't react each, with each other, but when th there is need for that reaction, the lightning provides the enough energy for surpass the great activation barrier for this reaction to occur. But there was another problem. No problem, 867. Or gases, they tend to escape from Earth, right? Uh, it would be natural to believe that the gases would escape to open uh, space. Or if the, the, the attraction is too much, it would become liquid under excessive pressure. So what was the solution? Oh, the right mass for Earth for a perfect gravity force to attract the right gases at the right temperature and pressure and the right density to also allow birds to fly. Why on destroying asteroids for the right, right friction at the right altitude? Isn't that great? A great combination, balance of many functions in a single atmosphere. So when an asteroid tries to hit us, friction destroys it high away from us. But there is another problem, problem 879. Sun, the, the star, our companion star, was really great, nearly perfect, but sometimes it was getting a little bit too nervous and were, were sending to us this solar wind, which is little radiation. So what was the solution? Well, maybe to select another star? Well, uh, perhaps, perhaps this guy does, does not like these simple solutions. So the, the solution was protect Earth with a magnetic field. And that is amazing, isn't it? Look at this. You know, the, the, the wind, try to, wind tries to reach us, but there is a shield, a magnet shield around Earth. And what is that? It's also an ingenious interplay of metal alloy chemistry. 
You know, the core of our planet is made of iron and nickel. It's an alloy. And the, the deeper you go, it becomes solid. And you go a little bit deeper, it becomes liquid. And you go a little, a little bit deeper, it becomes solid again. It's a miracle. <laughs> it, it doesn't make any sense at all. You know, solid, then liquid, and then solid again. And then it is believed. Nobody has been there, but it's believed there is a, a bowl of solid a metal that can rotate freely, lubricated by this liquid alloy, creating this extraordinary magnetic field. But there's more, what I like to call foresight for fun. <laughs> now the solar winds, as it passes through the poles, what does it do? It ionizes the nitrogen and oxygen. The same gases that were protecting us from UV. The same gases that are protecting us from asteroids. And making the birds fly, uh, fly and everything now. They are ionized by this solar wind. And excited to some orbitals. Uh, electronic ex excited orbitals and when they come back what what do they do they emit light which kind of light visible light green light uh, yellow red it's a show it's the most spectacular show on earth how do you call it aurora borealis foresight for fun but there are some more problems. On oh, 977, 78, 79, we need a 24-hour rotation because it's too cold, too hot. We need to rotate the Earth. We need seasons, ocean tides. So what was the solution? The perfect moon. Moon is wonderful in many ways. Has the right side at the right distance. It, it bends the Earth by 23.5 degrees, so you, we can have seasons. It also uh, shakes the water, creating the ocean tides. In many ways, Earth and this combination of Earth and Moon is extremely strong evidence for foresight. It's really difficult to explain the existence of the moon, you know that. There is a crazy process that, it, uh, that calls for a, a collision between, as, uh, between cosmic bodies that makes no sense at all. People were calculating it. The composition of this Earth and, the, uh, and, and moon are the same. They should be different. And the probability of that process to make a moon exceeds the uh, probability a content of the universe, but some people still believe in it. Anyway, but there is foresight for fun also related to the moon. You know that the moon is 400 times smaller than the sun, but it's 400 times closer to Earth. So when it comes in, in front of the sun, it covers the sun by how much? 90-90% would be okay, right? 101, okay, but it's 100%. It's perfect eclipses. Isn't that super in many ways? And uh, there was, I guess, last year here in the U.S., you could see it, and people were going on the streets, and what, would, what, what did they say? They say, what a show of a genius, what I call to call him a foresighter. I have learned that this makes no sense in English, but <laughs> foresighter <laughs> is the guy able, capable of ingenious foresight. Oh, but there's more problems. Problem nine, 987. Only an Earth with a solid surface would be too hot. We would need a liquid to buffer the temperature of the, of, the, of the planet and to also sustain life. What was the solution? The supernatural liquid of water. Water is supernatural in many ways, as you have probably heard about it. It has 74 unique properties. 
concentrate in the single liquid. It doesn't make any sense at all, does it? 74 properties in a single liquid, unique properties of that liquid. So it's a lot of playing with physics and chemistry. For instance, oh, this problem, 1002, solids sink, but ice must float on liquid, liquid water. It was a really difficult task then to calibrate the chemistry of water to, to um, display this property of floating on liquid water. So what was the ingenious solution? Uh, ingenious interplay of three-dimensional hydrogen bonding in liquid and crystal water. As a chemist, if you look at the structure of the liquids, the water molecules are still bounded by hydrogen bonding, bonding, but they are packed together more closely. When it, you go to the solid state, they organize nicely in this hexagonal shape. So ice expands. It's a miracle for a solid. A solid should be denser than its liquid, but it, for water, it's not. So what was the purpose of that? All in cold countries, like the US, not in Brazil, of course. <laughs> uh, when the temperature drops below zero, water at its highest density is still full of oxygen, goes to the bottom of the lake. And then ice is formed on the, cover, uh, on the top of the lake, and water is also, a, uh, ice is also a great thermal, I, uh, isolation, isolation, isolating system. So it makes a really nice, nice cap for this bottle so that the temperature can drop to much below zero, but still the fish stays there, <laughs> calm, protected, full, fully provided uh, of oxygen. And he loves this temperature. Four Celsius for him is perfect in many ways. But uh, related to ice, we have lots of foresight for fun too, like ice fishing. <laughs> Skating on ice. You know, you make pressure on a solid, it should become more solid, right? No. I, I think water escaped the uh, physics class. <laughs> and it, it, uh, decided to disobey the laws of physics because if you make pressure, it becomes liquid. So this lead from the skating, when it makes pressure on the solid water, the solid becomes liquid, so it's lubricated. That's why you can skate on ice. Foresight for fun. More for fight, uh, foresight for fun, yes, snow. They have been taking pictures of the crystals and there's a collection with more than 5,000 pictures, and none of them are the same as the other. They're all different. So that's what I like to call extravagant and stylish for sight for fun. <laughs> Too many. Well, what about in life? Do we see signs of foresight? Problems that have been solved in advance, foresight or death problems? Yes, many, many, many more than in the universe, I would say. Oh, the first problem was, was that, as for Earth, life also needed to be protected. Oh, the exterior is full of enemies, invaders, chemicals that can destroy life. So there, there was need for a wall, flexible but resistant wall. And there was a paradox also to be solved. The water should be in and out of that wall. And for a chemical point of view, this is a really difficult task. How do you encapsulate life with chemicals? And how do you keep water in and out? So what was the solution? Oh, first comes this wrong, primitive solution from evolution. You look, read some papers in science and nature, as I did, and you find there are some proposals that primitive molecules like fatty acids could have made some primitive forms of cells protected by primitive walls that could accommodate life. Is that for real? No. 
Evolution hopes you don't know chemistry. <laughs> and we, when you know chemistry, you look inside those my cells and you see there an environment that would never accommodate life. Because, why? Because it's no polar. It's like believing that gasoline could accommodate life. Is that possible? No. So if you put inside those my cells life, it will be soon destroy it. You like it? Yeah, Shh. destroy it. <laughs> <laughs> so what was the right solution from the foresighter, this ingenious mind that looked for the universe, looked for the, the life, phospholipids, a highly sophisticated cocktail of hundreds of phospholipids are in our cells. Different classes, diff uh, polar heads, no polar tails, or the carbon length varies. And the most spectacular feature, I would say, are the C's, carbon-carbon double bonds. Why C's? Well, trans are more stable, but the, the, the phospholipids also escape chemical classes, I would say, and make those C's double bonds. Uh, why? Because, you know, with the C's, Confirmation. It makes a click on the legs. And this clicking controls the fluidity of our membranes. And those members also need the sensors for temperature and pH variations. Now we know that the cell, as it change, uh, feels changes in temperature and pH variation, it changes the composition of those fluids, of those uh, phospholipids to uh, keep the stability of our membranes. It's an ingenious interplay of chemistry. So uh, if you look at the arrangements of the phospholipids, it's also uh, really nice because they, they lie uh, close to each other, parallel to each other. They expose their polar heads out and inside to the cell. Nice arrangement, but it's still, if you look at the top, you see that the, the both sides are still exposed to water. So how do you protect everything from water? It, it, the only way is to make a round shape, a ball shape. So the phospholipids has no way out. They, mu they must have a ball shape with an interior hospital to life. And then life can stay there forever and ever. Happy, happy and safe. But there was problem number two. A wall is not enough. You need gates. Nutrients should come from outside. Trash should be expelled to the outside. So you need gates. And one of the most spectacular gates are this one that I talk in my book, the aquaparines. They only let water go in and out. Of course, water is essential. But there is a miracle on those gates, too. As you know from chemistry, water, uh, water works as a proton wire. It conducts proton through the water liquid. So if you add a proton from one side, a proton will be transmitted and uh, eliminated from the other side. So how come now? That is a uh, gate allows water to enter. If it would allow waters to enter, protons would enter also using this uh, proton wire ability of water. So it was a great dilemma for life. We need water, but uh, the protons should be kept outside. Otherwise, they would destroy life. So what was the solution? It, it was a combined solution for number two and number three problems, the aquaparines. And they work in the super, super elegant way that I was try, I'll try to explain to you exactly where uh, the position where the uh, water enters that gate and passes through that gate. And a specific amino acid was played there, asparagine. And it, it's able to establish two hydrogen bonds with water. And it was placed in the perpendicular direction so when the water enters and passes through that gate, there, there is a click 
90 degrees click provided by those strong hydrogen bonds of this asparagine. So this asparagine works as a, as a plier, molecular plier, and it cuts the proton wire. Isn't that great? I love it. <laughs> and then waters can enter freely, and the bad guys, the protons, are kept outside. Uh, in 2003, this professor, Dr. Peter Egg, was awarded the Nobel Prize for discovering the acroporine gates. So now the question is, if they give a Nobel Prize for the guy who discovered the system, which kind of prize would you give to the guy who developed the system <laughs> at the first place? Answer me. Oh, there's problem number four. Amino acids were selected for proteins, but uh, as we know, there are two forms of amino acids, the L and D, the right hand and the left hand. And if we, you, we would use the two of them, no proteins would be made in this planet be because we needed 3D coherence. They should turn always to the same side. So to use a chiral mixture of amino acids would be a disaster for life. The life should use only one type of amino acid, either the L or D form. So what was the solution? Let there be homochirality. It's a really, really nice feature of life. Only L amino acids and D sugars were selected. From a chemical point of view, this is an extremely difficult task to separate those two and to eliminate one and to, and to work with fully pure forms, enantiomic forms of amino acids and sugars. But there was another problem, problem number five. The 3D shapes of the proteins were calculated to be the most stable. Fine, good job of calculating. But still those uh, most stable forms were hard to find because there are too many confirmations. So what was the solution? Chaperons. Chaperons are proteins. They are there to help the proteins to uh, fold correctly. So what is this? It's a great chicken and egg paradox. Chaperons for chaperons. What came first? Chaperons that I need for chaperons? There's no way out. Uh, we found out recently, I, I, I show paper in, I, I cite this paper in my book that grow EL is a substrate, a substrate of grow ES. So indeed, indeed, we need chaperones for chaperones. We need proteins to make proteins properly. Another problem, 569. Flagella and their motors were working fine. Bacteria were doing quite well, swimming happily on water. But how to properly interlace growing protein strands to automatically make such strand, uh, such resistant and elastic filaments? What was the solution? Let's use a cap as the guide. A pentagon-shaped template precisely designed with five legs to orchestrate the interlacing of five growing strands to form a resistant tail. And for this unique purpose only. Look at the cap. Do you see signs of foresight purpose as Michael B. was telling us yesterday? And what is the most amazing about this cap is we found no other use for that cap. So, if you know the argument, bye-bye co-option. Bye-bye, Miller. You didn't like it? I do. <laughs> Problem 945. DNA works perfectly to store information and is being perfectly copied into RNA pen drives. But their stability must be different. Why? Because you know DNA is there to store 
information as a storage device. So it should be stable for a long time. But the RNA is just to, to a messenger. It just takes the information from one point to the other. So it should not be stable. It should be uh, soon destroyed. So what was the solution? Because they are made of the same molecules. The solution was also really clever. It's chemistry. I'll try to explain to you. So few people uh, here understand chemistry, right? But I'll try to explain this to you. You see ribose there and the deoxyribose. The only difference is this OH, what, what we call hydroxy group. When the hydroxy group is there and hydroxy anio comes, takes a proton, makes an alkoxy intermediate that now will attack the phosphate uh, wire by, by an SN2 reaction, going through a, a six-member ring intermediate, and it will destroy this wire. You got it? <laughs> no. It's so simple. That's a clever, clever play with organic chemistry. The guy knew mechanism in organic chemistry. He knew that an SN2 reaction is favored with a five-member ring intermediate, and the deactivation barrier will be low. But now the DNA should not take, uh, this reaction should not take for DNA. So what was the solution? Remove the hydroxy group. Clever reaction, uh, solution. So now it's problem 10,585. Need to periodically wash intestine due to consumption of bad food. You know, he knew that we were stupid enough to go to some place, <laughs> try different types of food, go to Brazil, we go to churrascarias and blah, blah, blah. And sometimes we would consume bad food. What was the solution? The blessing of diarrhea. <laughs> diarrhea is a blessing, you know that. Is jet washing <laughs> and eliminates the problem in a really, really clever way. But there was a pro the, 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 the solution, you know, Murphy's law will tell you that every solution comes with two new problems. <laughs> and what was the problem? Well, this washing eliminates beneficial bacteria. So, what was the solution? Appendix. You don't know. I don't know if you have heard about it, but we found many, oh, at least two functions for the appendix. It works as a, a helper for the immune system and also as a reservoir of beneficial gut bacteria. So when the, 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 the diarrhea uh, washes away the problem, the gut bacteria is preserved there in the well-designed reservoir. But there was another problem, uh, appendicides. Y I don't know if you heard about it. I, I cite the paper in my, my book that we discovered that this is a problem with modern society. You go to some third world countries and appendicides is not a problem there. But it's a problem in the US. It's becoming more and more a problem in Brazil. It's our fault. It's some kind of habit that we have that it's causing appendicitis. But what was the solution? Let there be surgeons. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's many, many other foresight or death problems that were solved for life. I'll go really quick, quickly through, through those because I don't have much time left. Like, what was the problem? Correct binding of amino acids. What was the solution? Ribosomes. Energy production. What was the solution? ATP synthase. Cargo transportation. What was the solution? Robots. I don't know, but you are f a fool. Uh, you're, you're, lots of nanorobots are working inside you right now, like this guy he has legs, arms, and uh, transporting cargo through your uh, uh, molecular ropes inside your cells. Let's make synchronized powerful jumps. What was the solution? The best possible gears. Michael Behe mentioned that 
trying to destroy my talk yesterday. <laughs> Best possible gears. They are amazing. They're not symmetrical. You know, the teeth are not symmetrical. They're asymmetrical, which is really nice. It's the, most stro the strongest material possible. And it's just for the juvenile insect. When it, it gets older and bigger, the gears are not a good solution. So another solution is implemented. 200 sperms should get around the egg. The guy was calculating it. 200 is the perfect number. So let's start with 200 million. If you have too many sperms, it's a problem. If you have too little, it is also a problem. 200 is the ideal number. Another problem, we need to have single sperm fertilization. What was the solution? Hardening of the egg wall. Another problem, messengers for triggering at the right time and right station, many metabolic process. What was the solution? A cocktail of pregnancy hormones. I talk about that in the book. Uh, birds, I, I like to call this foresight for fun because birds could have a normal delivery, but uh, what was the solution? The most spectacular thing on earth, the egg. Read about that in the book. Bird migration, what was the solution? Bizarre magnetic plus quantum chemical GPS for birds so they can navigate throughout the whole world for many months, you know, following the, the lines of the magnet field of the earth. Extra nutrients, I like also to call this foresight for fun because it's for fun. The most bizarre yet spectacular thing on earth, carnivorous plants. Make the most powerful puncher on earth, what I like to call the Tyson shrimp, <laughs> is the most, what is the solution? The most efficient boxing glove ever. Make born to sex moth. You know, those moths, they just live for a few hours and they have, have to rapidly find a female, otherwise they are dead. So what was the solution? If they had to find a female in a few hours, let's make the most sensitive female detection system on Earth. <laughs> Read that book. Okay. <laughs> oh, Foresight was not my first book. I've, my first book was this Fomos Planejados. If you know Spanish a little bit, you can translate it to maybe made by design. And this has been made possible by the Center of Intelligent Design. It's association with Discovery Institute here in the US, Discovery McKenzie. But if you want to learn more about that, come for the afternoon section on intelligent design in Brazil. You know, the bird in the cover of my first book, I like to call it the ID bird, the intelligent design bird. Why? Because you look at the bird and the ID is there. You see I and the the I and the, the yellow dot and the D, do you see it? <laughs> ID is written on that bird. So it's, it's telling the whole world the cause of the bird, intelligent design. Oh, it is Brazilian Society for Mass Spectrometry that I'm the president, come for the afternoon section. So foresight or death, that's the principle behind the, the book which says that it's all or nothing. You have all or you have nothing. And the scientific evidence are showing it. So we have this book on biochemistry by Michael Behe, Complexity, uh, Paleontology by Mike, uh, Stephen Mayer, Biology by Douglas X, and now you have Foresight. <laughs> But there's much, much more, much, much more. Other details and other problems and solutions that point, point undeniable to foresight. But for that, you have to get the book. <laughs> I got mine. Got, <laughs> get yours. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Dr. Everlin. That was not only informative, but very entertaining.
And I always had an image of God as an engineer, but now I know he is a master chemist. As chemist. Well. Sure. So, chemical engineer. Chemical engineer. Okay. Go. I'll take it. I'll take that. So I understand you've debated on public television, radio, uh, intelligent design, and I was just uh, wanted you to share how those debates went. Oh, okay, yeah. yeah. We, had the opportun we, had, we had the opportunity in Brazil to, to participate in many debates. And for instance, in the first ever debate that I participated in McKenzie's University, it was my first ever debate and my first ever uh, action in defense of intelligent design. And I was, of course, shaking all over. <laughs> and I was afraid. And, and, but I, I think that this foresight is really great because, uh, first of all, they were asking, uh, the guy was claiming that 2% of the difference in the genetic code was a really uh, small difference. And we are really close to chimps. I don't believe we, we evolved it from chips. Uh, uh, the, the difference are too great. So rest in peace, you, chimps are not your relatives, according to science. And I told them, OK, 2% seems to be too little, but it's the Bill Gates effect. You understand this Bill Gates effect? 2% uh, Suppose Bill Gates come here and say, okay, guys, I love this conference, and at every, from everything that I have in terms of money, 2% will be given to this conference. You would just think it's too little? <laughs> you, would you complain with Bill Gates saying, oh, hey, give more? 2% <laughs> of 3.2 billion pairs of bases. So that was a really great and co-option argument for Miller. They say, OK, we take parts from other parts of the cells and we make the, uh, the flagello motor. I, was, I, I said, oh, that's the Mac uh, MacGyver effect. <laughs> you need a MacGyver to do it. And then I got famous for debating. And I'm quite often uh, invited to debate. And, of course, we destroy those guys with some, <laughs> this kind of arguments. All right. Well, I think uh, for the sake of time here, we'll close. But thank you very much, Dr. Abeling. My pleasure. Thank you. Get the booth. <laughs>